as well as um, and then the other uh, group of um, diseases was um, sort of viral, arboviral infections like um, uh, the you know flaviviruses, your dengue, Zika, chikungunya, things like that, um, that can both have a liver involvement, jaundice, as well as uh, fever and, and encephalopathy. And then finally, um, the the other um, uh, infections that can cause uh, acute hemolysis have a cerebral syndrome um, and obviously be febrile, uh, which are uh, malaria. And, uh, you know, in certain parts of the US on that list would be babesiosis. Uh, but because of the patient's um, uh, epidemiology and geography, uh, Oroya fever, uh, Bartonella bacilliformis was, uh, was one of the top considerations. Um, and the sort of physical findings and the lab findings kind of confirmed um, uh, the suspicion for, for the former category. There was indirect bilirubinemia um, and um, the peripheral smear actually did show um, uh, sort of the, the typical appearance of uh, the, uh, the Bartonella bacilliformis, the causative agent for Oroya fever, this disinfection that is endemic uh, to Peru and um, has a similar illness script in the acute phase to malaria, basically um, severe hemolysis, uh, systemic inflammation, oftentimes um, encephalopathy, sort of cerebral disease, as well as uh, ARDS commonly, which this patient also seemed to have. Um, in, but then also has a chronic phase I learned uh, from Mario's discussion of mostly sort of eruptive cutaneous uh, disease if you, if, you, if you survive and aren't treated in the acute phase. Um, sadly, this patient um, uh, passed away. Um, very young, young guy, a very tragic outcome. Um, so it was a bit of a shock for everybody to kind of process that, that outcome. Um, but I... Uh, uh, I learned a lot from the case. I was very impressed by uh, Mario and Aziz's uh, discussions and actually linked on the website is a great um, um, sort of infographic summary of the illness script by uh, Gabriel, um, who's with us today. Um, so very um, educational, um, although a tragic case if anyone wants to uh, spend a little more time with it. Um, where, where are we, Steph? We are ready to roll. Um, Rebecca's got a case for us. Great to see you. And uh, Nilayan and uh, Franco are going to join us in discussing. So maybe um, Franco and then uh, Nilayan, if you guys want to say hi and introduce yourselves, then we'll have Rebecca do the same and we'll begin. Great. I can start. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Franco, a Peruvian MD. Uh, Kiara introduced me to this amazing CP solvers family, and I already presented a case the other day, so I am happy to discuss this case today. Great, Franco. Thanks for being here. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm Nelayan. I'm a final year med student from Delhi, India, and uh, really happy to be here. Let's go. I love it. You want me to get started? Yeah, if you want to introduce yourself, people may uh, may recognize you as a regular leader and contributor, but if you want to say hi first, then we can get going. Perfect. Hey, everyone. I'm Rebecca Berger. I'm a um, hospitalist at uh, Weill Cornell, New York Presbyterian in New York City. Um, and Zavin and Steph were my senior residents when I was an intern. I feel like that's an important COI every time I'm on this, uh, I'm on this platform. Um, so I have a case of a patient I saw a couple months ago um, that I hope leads to some interesting discussion. Um, we, um, just uh, for our planning, uh, Zavin and Franco, do you guys want to pair up and go first? And then uh, Nilean and I can go second. Thanks, Rebecca. Take it away. Yeah. Um, so the chief complaint is left flank pain. Um, the patient is a fifty. Uh, seven-year-old um, with no significant past medical history, um, who again came to the ED with uh, left flank pain for several hours. 
Um, the pain had started about 7 p.m. the night prior, and he presented around midnight, um, tried taking some acetaminophen with um, really no improvement. Um, the pain kind of progressed, um, and he decided to come in, like I said, about five hours after his symptoms. He had no fever, no chills, um, no GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, no urinary symptoms, including dysuria, no hematuria, um, and he had never had any similar events like this in the past. And I think I'll pause here. Great, so I think I can start if, if it is okay with Lion. Okay, Lion? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, yeah, Perfect. Okay, so he's, right now we have a, a male, 57 years old with left flank pain. So anatomically first, I think we need to know if it is only located in the left flank, if it's not irradiated to another zone. So for example, we have the GI tract there, we have colonic issues, we can have kidney issues as well. Uh, if there is something like uh, viseromegaly, it could lead to an enlarged splenic, enlarged spleen. So it could also present to thing over there. I think also seeing the neurologic distribution it could also represent a referred pain of another intra-abdominal organ. Uh, it is important that to know that it already, it is resistant to acetaminophen. So it, I think it's something that is progressing uh, with no urinary symptoms could lead to more delay, more, not that a kidney problem, maybe a, a colonic problem as well. Uh, also thinking about other abdominal causes, maybe medical causes, uh, more more thing, something more rare like porphyrias could be also have another in, input there. Um, I don't know if you can take from here, Nilayan. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, we have uh, we have covered uh, some drug related causes and uh, some anatomical uh, localization of the pain. So uh, I'll try to cover, I'll try to uh, put forth my thoughts. So uh, left flank pain first made me think of pyelonephritis, but then we, uh, then, uh, but then we uh, got to know that there were no urinary symptoms. So uh, pyelonephritis is basically infection of the liver and the renal pelvis. It can either be ascending, that is uh, ascending from the bladder and ureters and then going to the kidney, or it can be descending, descending as in hematogenes. So the fact that patient has no urinary symptoms makes me think it can be descending. So we need to know if there is any uh, any foci elsewhere, which has now metastasized to uh, the patient's uh, kidney, the left kidney. Uh, so first possibility is pyelonephritis. Second, it could easily be a renal vein thrombosis. A renal vein thrombosis can occur due to uh, many, many causes. As Franco mentioned, drug-related causes are, uh, are very common. So uh, well, a male won't eat OCPs. OCP is a very common cause of uh, thrombosis anywhere. Uh, but something like APLA can cause it. Uh, if the patient had nephrotic syndrome, the nephrotic syndrome uh, can easily cause a renal vein thrombosis. It is notorious for causing renal vein thrombosis. Um, third thought I had, it may be a renal infarct. So uh, let's say the patient has an infective endocarditis and one of the septic emboli has uh, embolized into uh, one of the uh, renal cortices and the patient is presenting with renal infarct and flank pain. Uh, having said that, uh, diabetes can cause uh, cortical, uh, diabetes can cause medullary necrosis. Uh, so can sickle cell anemia and uh, they can present with flank pain. And as Franco mentioned, kidney is not the only organ there. We have also colon, we have uh, spleen uh, higher up there, uh, maybe a uh, psoas muscle, uh, so uh, uh, psoas abscess can infect uh, the renal fascia and then maybe perinephric abscess and uh, maybe then make uh, um, uh, affect kidney that way. Uh, but the uh, lack of fever uh, makes infectious, uh, makes, uh, makes infection less likely. And I think the white blood is gone, but okay, I'll carry on. Uh, so the patient had no infection, no chills, no dysuria. So yeah, inflammatory causes are less likely. So uh, maybe vascular cause, uh, we can put vascular cause right up there. And um, yeah, those were my thoughts. Guys, that was beautiful. Um, I love both of, both of y'all sort of taking an anatomical approach and thinking of the various structures there. Um, great reasoning around sort of the probability of um, uh, renal and sort of urinary tract uh, problems. Um, Nilayan, I don't think I'd, I've ever heard that kind of um, 
dichotomy of ascending versus descending, at least, you know, in those words. But I think that's a that's a great way to think about it. The majority of the time you get pilo by, you know, first having, a, you know, cystitis and, and the infection kind of going upwards. But as you um, said, you can have, a, you know, um, an infection like just a bloodstream infection or endocarditis or whatever, where then the infection spreads hematogenously uh, to the kidney. And, you know, in that case, um, you may or may not have a lot of irritative urinary symptoms, right? Like lower tract symptoms. Similarly, you know, we think of obviously passing a kidney stone or sand as, um, you know, causing, um, causing hematuria, causing uh, pain, irritation in the lower tract once it gets to the lower tract. But if you first acutely obstruct the ureter, you know, with, um, with a stone, you may only just have pain up here and not necessarily have a lot of dysuria and hematuria and all that stuff. Um, the, anyway, great, great discussion. I won't, I won't uh, re rehash everything else that you mentioned, um, but uh, just a fantastic start. I'll, um, I, I have two kind of general uh, thoughts that uh, maybe would be helpful to share. One is how much um, framing, like what you call something influences our thinking, right? So as soon as you hear, you know, flank, flank pain, I feel like the first thing people go to is the kidney, right? And, and y'all did a beautiful job kind of uh, not just anchoring on that or go, and, and thinking anatomically for everything surrounding it. But, you know, if a patient said, you know, it hurts like here, somebody could call that um, flank pain, right? Uh, uh, but it could very easily be in a muscular sort of or musculoskeletal little structures in that region. Um, and even though we think of, uh, this is the second part, we tend to think of musculoskeletal pain as more benign, right? Because so commonly it's just a sprain or it's overuse or whatever, but you can very much have infections or cancer um, in, the, in the bones, in the muscles, right? And it could still be a very serious diagnosis that, that you might wanna consider. Um, so I think that's a good good spot. Y'all 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 um, generated a, a, an outstanding differential. So um, Rebecca, why don't we hear more, and then um, the gentleman and and Steph uh, can continue the discussion. Perfect. So there's not a ton of data in this case. So each aliquot is going to be a little bit on the on the slimmer side. So. Um, I'll round out his kind of medical history. I told you guys that he has no, no real medical history, has never had surgery in the past, um, has never been hospitalized for any reason. Um, no notable family history, um, including history of um, uh, venous thromboembolism, no history that he knows of, of autoimmune disease. He has a, you know, his parents have hypertension and hyperlipidemia, but, but nothing else more than that. Um, he works as a physician actually at one of our local hospitals. Um, he, uh, drinks alcohol socially, um, did not, uh, use any IV drugs, uh, lives with his wife and kids, um, no recent travel, uh, or any other new exposures, um, takes, uh, no medications at home. Again, I just mentioned the acetaminophen, um, as a PRN, uh, and, um, has no allergies. I can, I can give you his exam too, because I think that'll give more, more discussion. Um, so in terms of his vital signs, um, his initial blood pressure was 145 over 86, uh, came down to 122 over 82 on recheck. His heart rate was in the seventies. Um, he was afebrile with a temperature of 36.6. Um, he uh, had a normal respiratory rate of 18 and sat in 100% on room air. Um, he was overall reasonably well appearing, um, sitting up in bed, um, not in any acute distress. Uh, he had anecteric sclera, a clear oropharynx with moist mucous membranes, heart that was regular without murmurs, lungs that were clear. His abdomen was soft uh, and non-distended. He did have a mild tenderness to deep palpation of the left uh, kind of mid abdomen and some associated mild left-sided CVA tenderness um, with no suprapubic tenderness. 
He had uh, normal pulses, no edema in his lower extremities, no rashes or any other skin changes. Uh, and he was neurologically intact. And I'll pause there. Milan, do you want to start things off in this section? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, starting from uh, where we left, past medical history, non-relevant medicine, um, uh, acetaminophen, I think that's PCM. Um, and I don't uh, know if there's any relationship between PCM intake and uh, kidney damage. So I'd leave that. Uh, parents had hypertension. Uh, so maybe we can look at the immediate causes. However, this patient doesn't have, uh, okay. This patient has a BP of 145 by 86. But then we, uh, I think we have discussed it before that pain can elevate BP. So um, I'm not too worried about that. Um, and um, no recent travels and no allergies. So I think we can keep that. Upcoming to vitals, uh, temperature afebrile. Uh, so yeah, I'll put infections further down. Or uh, maybe it can uh, it can be indolent infection, something like endemic, uh, endemic mycosis or something like TB. Um, but um, as of now, it's less likely, right? I'm, I'm looking more at um, um, maybe malignancy or, or an autoimmune process. Um, BP, uh, uh, BP uh, indicates uh, maybe a uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system involvement. That's obvious. The patient has pain. So SNS is getting activated. And um, well, general uh, cardiovascular pulmonary exams are clean, uh, expected. However, in abdominal exam, we have uh, a mild tenderness in, at, uh, at CV angle. So that localizes our organ to a renal um, kidney. That is, we can uh, quit looking for maybe a splenic or a colonic involvement here. So uh, we are now focused on uh, kidney and kidney-related pathologies here. And uh, apart from that, um, I had this idea of a perinephric abscess. So perinephric abscess uh, usually causes uh, something called a page kidney, whereby it compresses the kidney matter and increases the BP. So uh, well, uh, this elevated BP can be nothing, or it can be indicative of something like a perinephric abscess, which is increasing um, the blood pressure unnecessarily. However, there is nothing to indicate that the patient has an abscess because uh, this is uh, something like an acute process. And, uh, too acute for it to form an abscess. And um, something this acute, um, I'm thinking of uh, what it can be. So a 57 year old, old male, uh, autoimmune is less likely, can be an acute, de uh, acute decompensation of uh, some autoimmune process. It can be an infection. Uh, as I said, uh, infective endocarditis can present this way. And it can, uh, it may or may not have any murmur. Uh, murmur uh, having no murmur is, uh, does not rule out infective endocarditis in any, in any way. And uh, yeah, apart from that, uh, those are my thoughts. Wonderful, Nilan. Uh, Franco, did you want to add anything on or you want me to jump in? Uh, I think I could add that this is really an acute process, so we cannot rule out uh, vascular involvement, and it is something that is progressing. So I think I will tend to focus a little more in the vascular issues. And also, um, no, I think that's everything I want to point out. Nilan did already great on that. I completely agree. And I think um, both of you just make wonderful points sort of advancing the, the case forward, refining the differential diagnosis we have uh, with a largely anatomic approach. Nilayan, I wanna um, build on what you talked about with the vital signs and actually point out, I really appreciated that Rebecca said the blood pressure was 145 over 86 and on recheck, it was 122 over 82. So telling us, the, the, the mild hypertension did improve. But to me, it's also just a reminder that although we report vital signs as if they're a set of variables that are constant until we check them again, in fact, they're quite continuous. And um, particularly given that this patient is very early in his course, this is someone whose vital signs we might wanna check fairly quickly because his condition is evolving quickly. And particularly the lack of fever right now may not mean that a fever isn't building up or um, perhaps potentially coming in the future. So I think just the, the wording Rebecca used describing the sort of story of the vital signs is a great reminder of how these are really continuous variables. They're constantly evolving. And in a case that's presenting hyper acutely, as Frankel pointed out, 
we might want to actually check them even more to see what happens with the blood pressure, what happens with the fever, since this gentleman is only a few hours into this illness. Um, Franco, I just wanted to really commend you on your point that the fact that this is a hyperacute history of only a few hours of this pain really does speak to a primary vascular cause or perhaps a, an obstructive cause, right? If there's some obstruction of the bowel, of the large bowel there, if there's uh, another lumen that is blocked. I think that's really what we're thinking of in terms of the pathophysiology of something that could start very acutely. And I imagine, right, those are things that we're not really going to be able to tell from our exam alone that really we'll need to probably get cross-sectional imaging with a CAT scan with. And importantly, um, thinking about vascular causes in advance, as, as Franco mentioned, is important because the type of CAT scan we get is very important. And in this case, one using IV contrast is probably going to be most diagnostic for the conditions that we're worried about. So I wanted to just comment on the vitals, the fact that they're always evolving and may in this case, perhaps his blood pressure did improve just because he got a little more relaxed or had a little less pain when he arrived. But it's a great reminder that they can always move in any direction. Um, the hyperacute time course really factoring into the pathophysiology. And then I also want to just say what stood out to me is knowing that this is a physician. Uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious, um, Rebecca, like, is, did he say flank pain? Because it's so interesting, right? As physicians, we have some vocabulary to describe um, our illnesses, perhaps in ways that others might. And I, it's hard to know if that helps or if we could hinder things by using perhaps the wrong words that aren't actually going on. So I'm curious, Rebecca, like what was his word left flank pain? Um, he was actually more, more leading than that. His chief complaint was, I think I have a kidney stone. Wow. Um, so I think that that um, kind of speaking to both what you and Zavin said about the way a case is framed, I think that very much anchored um, the way we all started approaching the case, the ER did, et cetera. And that'll um, kind of, I'll show you guys as we get more information, but yes, it was, I think it, it's, it's a great point that someone who comes in either identifying what their concerns are, I think it's incredibly valuable, right? Because we, um, we can um, know what the patient's most worried about. We can often reassure them, you know, that what they're worried about isn't going on, or at least we can have that on our differential if it wasn't already. In this case, it obviously was. Um, but um, it can also be detrimental, I think, to the kind of diagnostic and clinical reasoning process, because um, we may we may very much anchor on what the patient tells us um, in this case. Yeah, I think he said blank, and then he, he specifically said the reason he came in so quickly was because he suspected he had a stone and uh, wanted to go to work the next day, essentially. Oh, wow. Okay. Because <laughs> that, that's another thing I thought, oh, gosh, you know, maybe it, the pain is so severe. That's why he's coming in. But hey, if he wants to make sure he can work, <laughs> that's another reason to come in acutely. Uh, let's turn it back to you, uh, Rebecca, for some more info. Perfect. So I'll give you guys some labs. Um, so he had, I just wrote in my note, CBC normal. I can pull up the actual numbers. Um, so his white blood cell count was 4.8. Uh, his hemoglobin was uh, 14 uh, uh, milligrams per deciliter. Sorry, grams per deciliter. His uh, platelet count was 405. Uh, his basic metabolic panel um, was also completely normal. So he had a sodium of 140, a potassium of 4.4, chloride of 105, bicarb of uh, 28. VUN of 20 and a creatinine of 1.0. We actually had no prior baselines in our system. Uh, he had LFTs checked, which were all normal as well. Let me go back to my note to see if there were any other labs that were relevant. Ah, his urinalysis. Um, so his urinalysis had uh, no blood, no protein, no glucose, no ketones, no bilies, no nitrites, no leukesterase, nothing. And then um, just to finish out your uh, framework here that his EKG was also completely normal um, and I, he did not have a chest X-ray. I will pause there. Okay, I think I can start right now if it's okay with everyone. Uh, well, uh, the CBC 
and the chemistry it's normal so that can also point out that this is an hyper hyper acute setting also the creatinine of one is not nothing to worry about it maybe he's tall he has a muscle fitness so that would be normal for him uh the urinalysis is really important i think because if we are thinking about an infectious cause of something that is going on in the kidney at least uh leukosters could be positive could be proteins could be blood in there uh also the vascular thing the vascular um, etiologies of this problem could also present with blood in the urinalysis so that's kind of a misleading thing about this one um we have to know that um this could also as i saw in the chat before this could also be a refer pain from the from the testicles could also be presented like that kind of sort of strange also there is no something visible in the physical exam about that something like a testicular torsion but for this age could be really really i don't know if, if there is no cancer involvement in that could be a really rare disease about that uh i think with everything that we have, we are still in need of high machine to, to get more idea of this case because the labs are completely normal. I don't know if there's something else that everyone, every, anyone wants to say. Um, I don't think I have much to add. I just had this thought that patient has this pathology for something like PIOS now. And um, whatever be the etiology, be it vascular, be it uh, infectious, the WBC of 4.8 is so low. I was expecting some sort of acute inflammation. So WBC should have been higher. Maybe the baseline, uh, maybe the patient at his baseline has a WBC that is really low, maybe 4.5 or maybe 4. So 4.8 is raised for the patient. But uh, I was thinking in terms of primary immunodeficiency, why are the, why are the WBCs not rising? Uh, maybe it's normal, maybe uh, 5 hours is too less. Uh, but to, I don't know. It, it it's just too weird for me for the WBC is not to rise uh, in the face of apparent inflammation. I mean, the kidneys have to be inflamed in some way. If it's impact, kidney will be inflamed. If it's infectious, kidney will be inflamed. Uh, whatever pathology you think, there is there is pain, right? There is a CV angle tenderness, and uh, if it's tender, I think there has to be some sort of inflammation there. If we are localizing it to kidney, uh, so yeah, WBC of 4.8. I am a bit I am a bit confused. I can't tell if Zavin uh, froze there. He, he just put in the chat, he had to run into the hospital to take care of something. So Steph, I think you're on your own. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, um, I am, you know, I'm reassured that the labs are normal here, but biggest thing is um, that normal UA, correct me if you, if you think this is an overstatement, Franco and the lion, but I think it really forces us to move away from the, G, uh, the urinary system at this point. Um, because um, while uh, I don't think of a UA necessarily as a very specific test for urinary pathology, I do think of it as very sensitive and to have no white blood cells, no blood really make some of the considerations of uh, pyelonephritis, nephrolithiasis, et cetera, much, much, much lower on the list uh, in my mind. Um, you know, I think at this point, you guys have built a nice anatomic differential diagnosis otherwise for other causes that can, can lead to the pain. So I think we do need to, right, uh, look, at the, um, look at the vasculature, look at the kind of colon that's in that area. Um, luckily, the EKG doesn't show this as a referred pain related to cardiac, but I think we'll need some more specific imaging. And then I just want to make sure we're not forgetting about the category of non-abdominal, non-thoracic kind of causes of maybe flank or uh, left side or however you want to phrase it. Um, and that makes me think of um, systemic causes of abdominal discomfort that we shouldn't miss that include metabolic syndromes like uh, hypercalcemia, right? Could, in theory, I'd be surprised if it presented this acutely, but can cause abdominal discomfort. Um, Franco mentioned the beginning porphyria. It's a rare diagnosis, uh, and it often takes a long time to diagnose, but certainly that's an example of a systemic condition that presents with abdominal pain. And then um, make sure also we just look outside of the body cavity altogether and think of, certainly um, we think of a herpetic neuralgia after someone has a rash, but 
There is such a phenomenon as pre-herpetic neuralgia. And so maybe going back to the patient one more time and really looking at where this discomfort is to see, does it fit a dermatome or not? The way it's described, it sounds like it's sort of left-sided abdomen. So that doesn't fit really as sort of a band across the side of the body. But I think you know, thinking about intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic, systemic problems, and then also external to the body dermatologic issues, I think would be our way to make sure we're not missing anything. But I, I agree with you guys. I think we're um, sort of at the point where with this pain being so severe, we might be at the point of just needing more dedicated imaging for it. But we'll see um, how the case evolves with Rebecca. Thanks, guys. And I apologize. There's not a ton of data for this case, which is why I had to uh, stretch it out into, into four aliquots here. So um, I will give you the first test that was done, which was a, a CT of his abdomen and pelvis with no contrast, um, again, to address the patient's concern about renal stone, um, which was completely normal. So he had normal appearing kidneys, normal liver, normal spleen, uh, normal bowels, again, all within the limitations of knowing it was a non-contrast scan. So I can, if anyone wants to reflect on that, feel free. And then I can give you the final piece of uh, data which reveals the final diagnosis. Franco, what do you think? Non-contrast CAT scan is totally normal. What do we do with that? Uh, well, I think that if that is normal, it will only rule out the kidney stone, maybe. It could also run any like gross anatomic problem, like some big tumor over there could also point out that this is not a intra-abdominal thing and it is more like a skin thing, maybe a refer pain of, of a neuralgia sort of, but it is important to know that this needs to be to, with contrast because we are thinking about a vascular that is our main concern right now. So I think the way that we need is that imaging. Uh, I can only comment that it's not something like really gross, it's something in, either in the skin or it is something vascular that the, the imaging that we have doesn't show up. I think, I think that's my talk. Well said, Milan, anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I have this thought that uh, when you talk about renal stones, about 90% of the renal stones are radio opaque, but 10% are radiolucent. And this is opposite of poly, uh, polylithiasis. The 90% are radiolucent and 10% are uh, radio opaque. So can it be, uh, can this be among the 10% of the causes of radioducent stones? But in the present, in the absence of any hydronephrosis, that is less likely. I mean, of, of course, there can be a stone which is causing a partial obstruction, but then why would a partial obstruction present with a flank pain? Uh, if we think of kidney stones, then kidney stones can cause flank pain, uh, in my opinion, in two ways. Either uh, it causes it cause an infection or uh, it, uh, it is causing distension. Uh, here, I think uh, X-ray has done an excellent job. Uh, CD has done an excellent job in ruling out any distension. And uh, in the absence of any fever or any acute sense of inflammation, I think uh, pyelonephritis is pretty much out of the picture. So uh, stones is uh, most likely uh, not the reason here. And uh, as Franco said, uh, I think we can rule out uh, any anatomical cause. However, uh, there is a purpose of contrast and the absence of contrast uh, does make uh, our, our absolute uh, uh, absolute measure on anything uh, wrong. We cannot say with an uh, absolute surety that this is ruled out or that is ruled out. There's always a, uh, there's always some uncertainty and I think a contrast would massively help. Well said. Um, I don't have anything to add. Good discussion of sort of what we might be missing, uh, what sensitivity we need from our diagnostic study. Um, so what do you have, Rebecca? Ask and you shall receive. Uh, we have a CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast. Um, so uh, he had a normal aorta, a normal mesenteric vasculature in terms of the celiac, the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. His right renal artery was widely patent. His left renal artery uh, demonstrated a focal dissection at the bifurcation of the renal artery. Uh, all of his pelvic arteries were normal. Uh, and then uh, notably his uh, left kidney um, had infarcts involving 30 to 40% of the left renal parenchyma uh, without mass or abscess. And then the remainder was unremarkable in terms of his GI tract, peritoneum, lymph nodes, abdominal wall. So the impression was left renal artery dissection with associated renal infarction uh, and no other vascular abnormalities. 
Franco, what are your uh, thoughts on uh, this this finding now? Well, this finally totally goes in the way that we were thinking about vascular issues. So it refers that if it refers that the if the present if the presentation is really acute with no inflammatory symptoms in the chemistry in the labs, it could also always lead to vascular, and we need we have to be aware of that. We have we cannot miss that like sort of diagnosis. Also, I think it is important that this patient will need more workup. Uh, on the way of my in my in the top of my head is that his platelets, although are in normal values, he could also have sort of a thrombophilia thrombophilias uh, problem. So he will need more workup regarding this diagnosis. It's, I think it's not normal to have a uh, dissection in 57 year old male with previous no history of that. So we can, uh, the solution will be a stent or to see if the left, if the left kidney is going to be more, it's going to take some damage in the long term. So he will definitely need to do some diagnosis work up after this regarding thrombophilic events and regarding vasculitis. Yeah, I completely agree, right? Now that we found what caused his flank pain, it is vascular. In fact, it's the perfusion to the left kidney. Why does this 57 year old man have this happen, right? With no known medical history. A any thoughts, Nilayan, on that? Uh, yeah, I was thinking of the same. Uh, the patient has a family history of hyperlipidemia. So maybe a patient has hyperlipidemia and we don't know about it. Uh, maybe uh, some familial hyperlipidemia can cause fluoride endothelial diseases. And then uh, add that to maybe a single episode of hypertension. Patient uh, might be running and his BP shot up. And then combine that high BP with endothelial damage. And then you might get a dissection. And then that dissection caused pain, which caused the BP to further raise up. And that vicious cycle goes on and on and on. So yeah, that was a far-fetched theory I had. But personally, I, I don't have any clue what caused this dissection. Uh, yeah, no clue at all. Yeah, and I, you know, certainly there's no history of trauma, right, or like iatrogenic intervention in the area, which can happen. Uh, no long-standing history of hypertension and associated atherosclerotic disease with that. Um, so it makes us wonder about the vessel integrity itself. Is there a fibromuscular dysplasia, a pathologic vasculitic process? Um, but, or, or did it happen spontaneously? And, you know, dissections can hop, happen spontaneously, but important is to rule out what the underlying factor is. So we'll, we'll hear from Rebecca if there is. Let me ask you guys one more question. And that is um, knowing now that because of poor perfusion, he had started infarcting sections of his kidney. What do you think about the urinalysis being completely normal? Does that fit to you? Are you surprised um, just going back? Because we anchored so much on that data point, or I did, saying, hey, I think we can move away from the urinary system. And here we are talking about a pretty major problem with the kidney. Um, so um, Nilayan, I, I don't know. What do you think about the UA and being normal? Uh, yeah, over the course of five hours, uh, I expected that urine analysis should be abnormal maybe trace hematuria, some proteins, but apparently apparently not. Uh, so uh, yeah, this is a very good reminder that we cannot anchor on urine analysis too much. Uh, even if it's normal, we always have to look for renal causes uh, because maybe fibers is too acute for uh, any changes to show on urine analysis. Maybe that's the way to look at this. Great point. The same philosophy, right? We had about vital signs and how those can evolve. Same goes for labs. So I think that's really well said. Uh, Rebecca, can we turn it over to you for any uh, resolution and teaching on this? Absolutely. Um, I love I love all this discussion. I think um, selfishly, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this case was because by the time I was admitting him as a hospitalist, all of this data had already been collected. So this was a case that I knew probably had an interesting differential from the beginning. And I was actually very, um, I was kind of, uh, what's the word? Um, I was impressed that the you know, that the ED doctor had decided to do that repeat CT scan. I think, you know, patient came in saying, I think I have a kidney stone. He had a negative UA and a negative CT. I think anyone could have just said, eh, maybe you pulled a muscle, you know, here's some, you know, lidocaine patches and, and you should go home. So I think um, I loved hearing the way you guys all thought through um, a, a really broad differential anatomically. And I think thinking about how there was really no evidence of the systemic inflammation really kind of 
led you guys towards a vascular cause. The question of why the UA was negative is, is an interesting one that still kind of puzzles me. I think, um, you know, I think it looks like Hans and Mohit kind of had the same thoughts I did, which is maybe the areas of renal infarct maybe weren't immediately adjacent to the collecting system and hadn't had a chance, whatever kind of uh, infarction, um, kind of downstream consequences there had been from that infarcted renal tissue maybe hadn't made it into the collecting system yet was kind of my best, my best guess. Um, in terms of workup, um, so he was seen by the vascular surgeons um, and somebody asked about management and they actually, based on the, based on the location and the size of the, of the um, uh, dissection, they actually recommended against um, any uh, interventions. Um, they recommended aspirin and statin and um, kind of conservative management essentially. Um, we did watch him overnight. Um, we did have the rheumatologist see him for the questions that everybody has brought up about whether he has um, a kind of issue with his um, vascular integrity, whether that's something like FMD. Um, we did end up re-imaging his renal vasculature with, with ultrasound. And I don't have a lot of um, data off the top of my head about the relative sensitivity and specificity of CT versus ultrasound, but I know there are situations, whether it's, whether it's carotids or or other vasculature where, you know, MRA versus CTA versus ultrasound can give you slightly different information. So I think the vascular surgeons and the rheumatologists wanted kind of specific flow measurements there. Um, but on review of his imaging, they found no evidence of FMD and it really is a radiologic diagnosis. Um, we did send off a pretty extensive rheumatologic workup looking for things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, other hypocoagulable diseases, um, um, other, I can run through the whole list, but as you would imagine with many rheumatologic processes, we sent off uh, a whole whole host of, we sent off cryos and um, a number of other um, tests and basically everything came back negative. Um, so the, the final diagnosis here was a spontaneous renal artery dissection. Um, the only thing that came back positive was an A1C of 5.9. Um, so he had a little pre-diabetes, but you know, not thought to be enough to probably give him kind of widespread atherosclerosis, no, was, nor was there evidence of that anywhere else on his body. His LDL was like in the 100s or 1 teens. Um, so, so yeah, he was diagnosed with this spontaneous renal artery dissection, um, has, is seeing vascular surgery like every six months for follow-up. Um, and uh, we all kind of had to shrug our shoulders and send him home because he was feeling better. Um, but uh but that's kind of where we left the case. And I just looked in his chart and it looks like no, no uh, hope, thankfully no subsequent events in the last few months since this first one. Wow, so interesting. And what a, I, I, I would be so curious to pick the mind of the physician that ordered the, con, you know, who, who said, let's get a second CAT scan, right? Like right. doing the same test again, but with a different protocol is so rare. What a smart move. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't help, I don't know if this is um, cynical or, or pessimistic or what, but I don't know if also because this was a physician, the sort of um, diagnostic pursuit was really there. And I can't help but wonder if it was a, you know, a different type of patient, right? Someone um, who, you know, just because of who they are, what they looked like, et cetera, like could have been sent out the door, just as you said. Um, I don't think we'll ever know necessarily, but, um, what an interesting decision to get another CAT scan with a different protocol. Really, really uh, well thought out. Yeah, absolutely. I think I said that before. I think that was that was my main takeaway from this case was being like, wow, I don't know if I was the ED physician if I would have thought to do that. And I think it just reminded me, and that's why I wanted to, you know, bring it to this forum was always think about that differential diagnosis. And but but when do you decide, right? When do you decide that this could be something vascular, but it's so rare and you know, why couldn't this be a musculoskeletal thing? Or maybe this, you know, um, the, the kind of pre, pre zoster zoster that, that people were talking about, zoster syn, syn herpetica, right? So um, there are so many other things it could have been. Um, and exposing him to another round of radiation is not benign, nor is contrast. So I think, um, I agree. I think I was impressed by the, by the thinking of the physician who decided that that was worth doing. Um, and just want to kind of wanted to put myself in his shoes and, and think about a broader differential as you guys did. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for the case. And Elaine and Franco, thank you so much for discussing so well, just wonderful thinking through uh, both the, the algorithm and, and what negative tests do and don't mean. Just fantastic. Um, Gabrielle, we'll turn it over to you for some final teaching points. Hmm. Such an amazing case, Rebecca. Thank you so much. 
Uh, for teaching points, at first we had a 57-year-old male who presented with this flank pain. So we were starting to localize the lesion. We were thinking what organs are in the flank region. So we were discussing about kidney problems at first. This could be a pylor, renal stones, perinephric abscess. Uh, so it could be also some colon, a, a spleen, a skin problems such as herpes zoster, neuralgia, musculoskeletal problems, and also systemic conditions localized into the flank region, such as embolic diseases, for example, are, um, endocarditis or porphyrias. Uh, then with the physical exam, the labs, and the imaging, we were collecting clues about what etiology could explain all of this, this hyperacute flank pain. So at first in the vital signs, this patient had a high blood pressure. So we were thinking this could be because of the stress of the hospital. And also Nilayan said an interesting fact about this could be a perinephric abscess, compressing renal parenchyma uh, that uh, this could be a, like a page kidney. We were uh, also the physical exam showed skin changes. So we were uh, started thinking about this could be explained by herpes zoster or some endemic mycosis. And we, we were also discussing about the nature of the pain and this pain was hyperacute and progressing. So Franco and Steph uh, taught us really well about this. Uh, because of this nature, we, we, we want to think about first of morbid conditions, such as vascular problems, for example, renal venous thrombosis, aortic aneurysm, and we don't want to miss that. Uh, also, in, since this pain is hyperacute, fever, um, for example, in this case, a uh, urine analysis, uh, ba the white blood cell and the basic metabolic panel could be normal because this could represent the beginning of vascular infections and metabolic diseases. Uh, but also we, uh, we at first had on the top of our list musculoskeletal problems and skin issues. Uh, then with a non constant CT that was normal, so we were start thinking, okay, this could be explained by extra abdominal etiologies, but we uh, still don't want to rule out vascular etiologies since they are very morbid. One test that could help us is the carnet sign that uh, uh, means that the pain gets worse when the abdominal wall get, gets tense, and this suggests the pain has an extra abdominal source. And the end of the case, the contrast CT showed a left artery dissection with associated renal infarction, and that was a final diagnosis. So thank you a lot of guys for flagging in. Hope you have a great day. Beautiful set as always, Gabriel. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Nilan. Thanks, Franco. Everyone have a great day and see you next Wednesday. Bye. Bye, everyone.